everyone, and welcome to Taylor Westing's latest data protection webinar. And this is part of our data protection webinar program, and this is where we bring you our expertise, our views on topical data protection issues. My name is Sally Anero, and I'm a senior member of Taylor Westing's London data protection practice. Those of you who join us regularly will be very familiar with the, the wide range of topics that we've, we've tracked on data protection over the years, including uh, those you know, core requirements and practical applications of the GDPR, but also sessions where we've looked at the data protection issues for you know, particular areas such as cookies and ad tech, cross-border data flows, Brexit, um, as well as looking at topics around cyber security and, and direct marketing. So today we're going to be looking at children and personal data, whether that's in relation to compliance under the GDPR or developing statutory standards on age-appropriate design, um, also those perhaps more esoteric privacy considerations of the parent-child relationship, or indeed the wider regulatory safeguards relevant to safeguarding children online. To speak to these different topics, I'm joined by several members of our data protection practice here in London. To start with, my colleague Debbie Haywood will be looking at those requirements of GDPR that relate to the processing of the data of children. And then following Debbie, Tamara mackay Temesi will be looking at the ICO's work towards uh, fulfilling that duty that Parliament imposed on the Information Commissioner in the Data Protection Act 2018 to create a statutory code of practice on age-appropriate design, and which is likely to have some significant impact on those who are providing online services that are likely to be uh, accessed by children. I'll then briefly take a step back to consider the role of online services in the care control dynamic between parents and children in the home. And then my colleague Nikita Sadie will consider any other key areas of regulation that can be relevant to safeguarding children online. At the end, we'll have our, our usual short selection of polling questions where you have an opportunity to give us your feedback on a number of topical questions and to get, also get an aggregate view of the collective uh, response of listeners today on those questions. So without further ado, I will pass you over to my colleague Debbie Haywood to think about what the GDPR uh, and children, how they relate to each other. Thanks, Sally. Um, I'm going to be looking at the GDPR in the context of children's personal data and, and picking out some of the issues which need special consideration. Data protection laws always cover children's personal data, but the GDPR introduces special protections for them um, for the first time. It doesn't say as much as you might think specifically about children, um, so it's also really important to keep in mind the um, ICO's guidance on children and the GDPR, which um, is a sort of special part of the GDPR guidance. Um, and when you're really getting into the specifics, the Data Protection Act 2018 may also be relevant in the UK. So the starting point for everything is actually in one of the recitals to the GDPR, which um, I'm going to quote it in full because it, it does inform how you look at data um, more widely. Children require specific protection with regard to their personal data as they may be less aware of the risks, consequences and safeguards concerned and their rights in relation to the processing of personal data. Such specific protection should in particular apply to the use of personal data of children for the purposes of marketing or creating personality or user profiles and the collection of personal data with regard to children when using services offered, to, offered directly to the child. Now, the recitals are not binding, but they can be taken into account when considering compliance, and they should inform the application of the binding provisions, so they are important. The ICO also points to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which requires that the best interests of the individual child be considered. In the Draft Code of Practice on Data Sharing, the ICO says, it's unlikely that the commercial interests of an organization will outweigh a child's right to privacy. Considering the best interests of the child should form part of your compliance with the lawfulness, fairness and transparency principle. So what this means is that you should always think about whether you're processing children's personal data and take children's vulnerability into account in the way you communicate with them, in terms of what you do with their data and also how you give effect to their rights. There are probably two main issues when dealing with children's data from the point of view of the controller. 
Children aren't an amorphous mass. There's obviously a huge difference between the understanding of a 10-year-old, say, as against a 16-year-old. But also, of course, different levels of awareness among similar age groups. One 16-year-old is not the same as another. Um, the data controller doesn't always know they're dealing with a child, and a child can mislead the controller about their age. The second issue is that children's data is relevant even when a controller isn't targeting children, but where the processing of children's data is incidental. So bearing all that in mind, there are a number of areas where you need to pay special attention if you are or may be processing children's personal data. Under the GDPR, as you probably know, data controllers have to rely on a lawful basis from the list in Article 6 in relation to each processing operation. Any of these bases can be used to process children's data, but you may also need to factor in additional considerations. Valid consent, for example, is even trickier to obtain when you're dealing with children. As well as all the usual factors involved in getting GDPR consent, data controllers have to consider the competence of the child and whether they have the capacity to understand the ramifications of consent. If they do, then they can, can, can provide consent unless it's evident that they're acting against their best interests. If the child is not competent, then their consent cannot be informed and will be invalid. Another factor in gaining informed consent is pre presenting information in such a way that the child will understand it. And this is made more complex due to the different levels of understanding among different age groups. Consent also has to be freely given, and any imbalance in the relationship between the data controller and the child is likely to compromise that. There's a Swedish regulator, for example, recently fined a school um, around €20,000 for failure to have a lawful basis for processing personal data after the school installed a facial recognition system with the consent of the children via their parents. Um, one of the key factors was that the consent was invalid due to the imbalance in the relationship between the data controller and the data subjects. Now, even though it wasn't actually the children giving the consent in this, in this instance, the fact that the children were having to go to the school um, and, and didn't really have much choice about consenting was relevant to the assessment of, of the validity of consent. There's no set age at which a child is considered competent to provide consent, apart from in relation to digital consent, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Data controllers have to take into account the age of the child and the complexity of what they're being asked to understand. A further complication is caused by the child's right to withdraw consent at any time once they're competent to do so. And this means that if you accept consent from someone with parental responsibility on behalf of a child, you need to ensure that the child knows they can withdraw that consent once they are competent. The ICO suggests including that information um, in all communications with the child about their privacy settings and how to update them. Now, if you're relying on the lawful basis that processing is necessary for the performance of a contract entered into by the child, again, competence is the main issue. In Scotland, for example, children under 16 have no capacity to enter into contracts. Um, the general rule in the rest of the UK is that children over the age of seven can enter into contracts, but they can also effectively con cancel the contract at any time. And if that happens, then there's not going to be a lawful basis for ongoing processing. Where processing is carried out on the basis that it's in the legitimate interest of the data controller, this always has to be balanced against the rights and freedoms of the data subject. The GDPR explicitly underlines the importance of this balancing test where the data subject is a child. And in its Children and the GDPR guidance, the ICO stresses that it's the responsibility of the controller to assess the risks to the child and to protect them, including by prioritising their interests. And this applies even when the processing of children's data may be incidental. If you're relying on other lawful bases, for example, legal, legal obligation, vital interests, or a public task, the main issue to keep in mind is that what is proportionate or required may vary where the data subject is a child and depending on their age. So you're always keeping this in the back of your mind. If you're processing special data, like health data, in addition to a lawful basis, you also have to meet one of the conditions for processing under Article 9, which you need to read in conjunction with Sections 10 and 11 of Schedule 1 of the Data Protection Act 2018. Yes, it is very complicated. If you're required to carry out a necessity test, then again, it's a question of giving special consideration to the child and what's in their best interests. 
So you can see just from that pretty brief analysis that while children are only specifically mentioned in relation to the balancing test for legitimate interests and necessity, you have to think about the lawful basis you're using in quite a different light when applying it to children. One area where the GDPR is very specific about the difference when dealing with children is the age of digital consent. It says that only children aged 16 or above can give consent online to receive an information society service unless the consent is for an online preventative or counselling service. This actually is pretty wide ranging. It covers most online services and generally includes websites, apps, search engines, online marketplaces and online content services. The services don't have to be offered directly to children but will be considered by the ICO to be made available to them if they're offered to users without age restrictions or where any age restriction allows users under the age of 18. Services provided by an intermediary like a school are actually exempt from this. Children under the age of digital consent have to have the holder of parental responsibility give consent on their behalf. And member states are allowed to lower that age as far as 13 as the UK has done. I mean, it does seem, to be honest, it seems a little bit odd that a piece of legislation which is aiming to harmonise data protection law allows this level of divergence, especially because it means that in practice, when a child is giving consent, it really needs to confirm the country it's in, um, or, or there needs to be some way of identifying this so that different age limits across the EEA can be respected. Obviously, that involves collecting more data. Um, this view is supported, though, by EU-level guidance. Oh, sorry. Moved on too quickly. Um, it's fairly easy to understand what the age of digital consent is in, in individual countries, and we've set out a summary table which you can see on our global data hub. But it's much harder to verify the source of consent. Obviously, both, that's both the age of the child consenting and whether the holder of parental responsibility has given consent if they need to. The ICO's guidance says that this is a matter of fact as to whether or not consent has been lawfully obtained from a child, but in the event of a complaint, it will look at whether the data controller has made reasonable efforts to verify that the child is old enough to provide their own consent, taking into account the risks inherent in the processing and available technology. The GDPR explicitly requires data controllers to make reasonable efforts to verify that any person giving consent on behalf of a child does in fact hold parental responsibility. Now again, what's reasonable will take account of the inherent risks in the processing and available technology. The ICO gives some examples and says that collecting a child's email address in order to send them a fan newsletter is likely to be low risk and asking for tick box confirmation of age may well be sufficient. Higher risk services though, for like chat rooms or um, things which allow users to upload p more personal data will require additional efforts. And the ICO suggests that in those situations it may be advisable to use a third party verification service. Now, the ICO does understand that um, that kind of service um, availability is dependent on technologies and can also result in the need to collect further data. There are techniques which can be used for verification from facial recognition to the scanning of document verification, but all of them involve processing more personal data. The ICO says this shouldn't be undertaken lightly and principles of data minimization and deletion have to be observed. As with so much of GDPR compliance, there are no hard and fast rules, so it's really important to document your decision making and processes, preferably by carrying out a DPIA before processing begins, even where you may not be, strictly speaking, obliged to do one by law. One area where the ICO is very clear that you do need to carry out a DPIA before processing a child's data is when you're doing it for marketing purposes. And this covers direct marketing and targeted or online behavioural advertising. The ICO says that in all circumstances the child should be specifically protected and it's crucial not to exploit any lack of understanding or vulnerability. For example, children must have their right to object to direct marketing clearly set out. The Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, or PECA, uh, may also be relevant here because consent will be needed for the majority of electronic direct marketing, um, subject to um, a few exceptions. But um, if you're using consent under PECA, or if you're required to get consent under PECA, it's also going to be the lawful basis for the related processing, and then you're going back to the issues around gathering children's consent. You may also have to consider advertising standard rules, and Nikita's going to talk more about that in, later in the webinar. Another area I want to highlight is um, solely automated decisions and profiling. 
Article 22 of the GDPR prohibits this, where decisions have a legal or similarly significant effect on the individual, subject to limited exceptions. While Article 22 and the exceptions apply equally to child and adult data, Recital 71, again, that's one of those non-binding provisions, states explicitly that solely automated decision-making, including profiling with legal or similarly significant effect, should not concern a child. Um, it does appear to be something, possibly something of a drafting oversight that this isn't mirrored in the body of the GDPR, but it does show that this type of processing of children's data should, in the words of the ICO, not be the norm. Um, this view is supported by EU-level guidance on automated decision-making, which says that where possible, controllers should not rely upon the exemptions in Article 22.2 to justify it. EU guidance also recommends that you should avoid profiling children for marketing processes. Uh, as I said, the Article 22 prohibition only applies where processing has legal or similarly significant effect. It's pretty easy to assess what might have legal effect, but it's harder to assess what has a similarly significant impact. And the ICO's guidance gives the example of solely automated processing of a child's data to influence the child to make poor food choices, which could damage their health as being something that is a significant effect. So in general, a good sort of rule of thumb is that if advertising standards prohibit or limit the marketing of certain types of product to children, that's a good indication that influencing a child's choices in that area uh, by using automated processing could have a similarly significant effect on them. If you do decide to engage in this type of processing, then in the first place a DPIA will need to be carried out to establish that the child's rights are sufficiently protected and procedures must be put in place to properly protect the interests of the child. The information requirements have to be complied with and presented in a way that the child will understand and the child must be given the right to obtain human intervention and the right to give their own view and contested decisions. All of that information, which there's quite a lot there, has to be presented to the child in a way in which they can understand. The ICO's recently updated draft code of practice on data sharing is yet another example of the additional care you have to take when dealing with children's personal data. <coughs> the emphasis is here is on privacy by design and default, and again a DPIA is advised even when not mandatory if you're planning on sharing children's data. The best interests of the child are paramount and their data should not only be shared where there's a compelling reason to do so which is in the child's best interest, for example for safeguarding. Where data is going to be shared with a third party, due diligence checks should be carried out. If you can reasonably foresee that the party will use data in a way which is detrimental to the child, you shouldn't share it at all. There are exemptions which allow you to process children's data in ways in which the GDPR wouldn't otherwise allow. They're covered in Article 23 and Chapter 9 of the GDPR and in Schedules 2 to 4 of the Data Protection Act 2018 in the UK. They're highly specific and they vary across the EA and I'm not going to go into them in detail for that reason. Um, there are fewer, as I said, fewer explicit references to children's personal data as a special case in the GDPR than you might expect. But given that protection in Recital 38, the overall message is that you need to be extra careful when processing children's personal data, and that will almost certainly involve carrying out a DPIA before the processing operation begins. In essence, you need to be more transparent, more considered, and more accountable with children's personal data, and you need to ensure that all your communications with children are easy for them to understand. Protections have to be implemented at the design stage, and, and not just privacy by design and default, but all the data protection principles need to be considered in the context of children's personal data. I think if I want uh, to give you a take home from this, it's that this is um, GDPR++. It's, it's mostly like the rest of the GDPR, it's just more so GDPR on steroids. Um, I'm going to now hand you over to Tamara, who's going to dig into the detail um, and talk you through the ICO's draft age-appropriate design code. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, so we've heard about why children might require specific privacy safeguards and some of the way the GDPR and the ICO goes about doing that. In the UK, this protection will go even further, and the ICO is bringing in a new code of practice for online services which are likely to be accessed by children. So we expect that the code will have quite a far-reaching impact on most websites, apps, platforms, whether or not they're necessarily aimed at children. The code will also have statutory weight, and the ICO will consider it in the context of its investigation and enforcement activity. 
Um, so we're going to go through a very brief timeline of how and why the code came about, a summary of a couple of the common potential concerns that were raised during its consultation period, and then we're going to focus on practical tips for preparing for the code entering into force, which we expect will be later this year. Um, so if we begin with our timeline, I think we all know that last year, 25th of May 2018, the GDPR came into force. Um, as Debbie mentioned, it recognized children's need for protection in particular, but didn't go into a huge amount of detail as to how to provide this. However, it does envision member states introducing their own codes of practice to supplement it. The Data Protection Act 2018 for GPA came into force on the same day and supplements the GDPR. But as it was being drafted here, there was a large number of campaigners that were fighting to get certain amendments um, as it was going through Parliament. Um, one of these organizations, Five Rights, along with Baroness Kidron, um, was one of the most prominent, prominent groups, and it sought, as they said, uh, a new deal between children and the tech sector. And in particular, what they wanted was to redress the balance between the needs and safety of children and the commercial interests of long online services. And they were quite successful in that. We obviously have the draft code. Um, and what the ICO was actually required to do was to prepare a code containing guidance on age-appropriate design standards for relevant information society services likely to be accessed by children. So the ICO had 18 months within which to prepare and submit the code to Parliament, and in doing this it was um, required to consult with different trade organisations, parents, children, child development experts, um, and to consider the UK's obligations as a signatory to the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of a Child. Um, the UK then published the draft code for consultation, so just under a year from the DPA GDPR, seven months prior to the deadline, um, and some of you may also have noticed this was about a week after the Online Harms White Paper was released for consultation. Um, the consultation closed only about a month and a half later in contrast to the sort of nearly three months consultation period for the Online Harms draft White Paper. Um, this was a very tight consultation period. But nonetheless, there was a really significant amount of feedback, some of which the ICO has published. The ICO is now working to finalize the code, taking into account that range of feedback it received. And we'll look at some of the common points that came up in that shortly. Uh, but first, we expect um, a revised version of the draft code um, around 23rd of November, thereabouts, with the aim of it coming into effect by the end of this year. Um, once it goes before both Houses of Parliament, either the House of Commons or the House of Lords might decide that they're actually not going to approve it. They have 40 days to do that. If neither of them do so, then the ICO must issue it and it will come into force 21 days later. However, um, there is going to be potentially a transition or a grace period of up to about 12 months from the day it comes into force. That means um, that looking at 2020, it's important to start thinking about if the code might apply to you, which it may do even if you don't think you deal with children, and how to prepare and implement it. So what does the code actually cover? Um, it contains guidance on standards of age-appropriate design um, for information society services likely to be accessed by children. This is not just sites actively targeting children. Um, information society services, like Debbie was saying, is, is very, very broad. It's going to be sort of any service normally provided for remuneration or payment at a distance by electronic means at the individual request of the recipient. And this doesn't mean that payment needs to be coming from your users. It might be instead coming from advertising sources or business partners. It can also catch some not-for-profit sites if what they are doing might be considered a sort of economic activity. And we expect this is going to prove quite challenging for a lot of site operators since information society services of various sorts can be found across a large number of sites, apps, portals, platforms. It covers a huge swathe of online activity. Um, for these, however, for everyone that's caught, the code contains 16 interconnecting provisions that set out the requirements online services have to meet to make their services suitable for children. And as you can see, topics range from data minimization to connected toys. When enforced, the code will sit alongside the DPA 2018 and provide structure to site operators' data privacy compliance efforts, as well as standards for the regulator to consider when it's determining the fairness or otherwise of processing activities. As with privacy by design and default, the ICO expects the standards in the codes will be built into your design processes from the start, 
and into any subsequent upgrades and your service development processes and into your data protection impact assessment processes. It is far reaching. So it remains to be seen exactly how it will be updated and enforced, but we don't anticipate that the revised code is going to be drastically different to its current form. That being said, um, as, broad as is it, broad as it is, the ICO has always been a very practical and proportionate regulator. Elizabeth Denham reiterated last year that they've always preferred the carrot to the stick, and we'd expect that approach to continue. Although in the heightened regulatory context of the GDPR, and we're obviously beginning to see some significant signs under that. So what are some of the potential concerns that were raised during the consultation process? Um, we'll go through these fairly quickly before we get on to some sort of practical tips. Um, the first is looking at sort of age-defined terms or standards. The code looks at things, uh, services likely to be accessed by children or likely to be accessed by under 18. So there's some inconsistency of language. It's also potentially not aligned with other established terms like offering services to data subjects or directly offering to children. Um, so that's something to be aware of. The draft code also refers to parents' involvement in decision-making for their children, but doesn't necessarily recognize that that often falls away in other areas of life around 16, and the code obviously covers children up to 18. Um, here, we're also looking at the code maybe look, needing to account for the capacity or reason and sophistication of older teenagers, and indeed, the technical knowledge of many much younger children. If you think about how many times kids end up explaining tech to their parents, Digital literacy can obviously be quite complex. There's also a potential risk here of inadvertently undermining UK compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. There are other rights that need to be balanced with privacy, like expression, uh, freedom, uh, right to association, access to information from media, um, and particularly if there's a risk of any sites responding by restricting access to under 18. Next, there's also potential data protection risks, and you will see this, I imagine, come up time and time again. If we're looking at the draft code proposing that all users are treated as children, um, as if children are the default, and it anticipates the need for more complex and maybe intrusive processing through things like age verification mechanisms, these, of course, may conflict with data minimization obligations and maybe create large pots of ID data, which could be a target for cybercrime and fraud. So it remains to be seen how to balance these sort of robust age verification requirements with data minimization. And at the moment, there's very little guidance for technical implementation. There is also uh, Brexit, which I think we can't avoid talking about. Um, like the GDPR, there's some degree of extraterritorial reach. Um, however, the draft code doesn't apply to organizations without an establishment in the UK and whose lead supervisory authority is not the ICO. This might mean that the cost of complying with the draft code may mean that some businesses may reconsider where they're based. There's also a note, uh, a risk of divergence of, from the EU27, which could affect any sort of future UK adequacy ruling in respect of data transfers. So, on to the practical tips. Um, despite some of these issues, and we've, as we've mentioned, we don't expect the reissued code to be significantly different to the existing draft, and it's sensible to start thinking about if the code's going to apply to you, if you don't think it will, how to demonstrate that to the ICO, and if it probably will, then how to comply with it. So this is a sort of high-level counter through some practical tips under each of the 16 interconnecting provisions. So we begin with the best interests of a child. This should always be your primary consideration when you're designing and developing online services likely to be accessed by under 18. It's a really overarching requirement. It's an extension of the GDPR principles of privacy by de design and default. So working out what's in a child's best interest is not always easy. Um, it can be particularly complex for services which can be accessed by users of any age but don't necessarily actively target children. And as we all know, children may not be best placed to decide it for themselves. If you begin with then age-appropriate application, uh, this is the second point. Think about the age range of your users. Does it include young children? Does it include teenagers? Is it only adults? It might not be easy to design for all of these, so you might need to draft your information for the lower end of the age range to make sure that everyone understands. You can also think about suitable ways to determine your users' age ranges, and if there are ways of doing that that don't involve tracking individual users. If you think children are likely to access your site, even if it's not designed for them, you should be applying the standards of the code to all of your users unless you've got suitable age verification mechanisms in place to distinguish adults from children. 
In terms of transparency, your information should be clear, concise, and noticeable. And like we've seen, this is sort of just an extension of the GDPR. If you're doing anything unusual or unexpected with data, these requirements are particularly important. You should think about using bite-sized specific notices if something new or different is happening with personal information, like key facts boxes maybe for, um, to communicate financial information. Also, don't assume if you have a site or service focusing on children that you won't need to provide much more detailed technical information on cookies and processing. It will just need to be the case that there's a balance struck between transparency and accessibility, and this might require a layered approach. For example, have a summary of key transparency points, which users can expand to read a more complex explanation. You can also here think about things like legal design as a way of achieving transparency. If you can take a more human or user-centered approach um, and think about ways that you can present information in a really engaging, accessible way. Think about infographics, comics, icons, anything that might help your users, especially children and their parents, navigate the information you're providing to them. Next, we're looking at detrimental use of data. So think quite carefully about the harm that could come from using children's personal data specifically. Things that might be perfectly normal for adults may not be acceptable in respect of children's information. For example, profiling for direct marketing purposes. Possible harms need to be considered broadly and unlikely risks given more weight. You should also think about your own industry or sector codes of practice and other regulatory provisions or government advice. The code is not the last word on what's appropriate or detrimental. In terms of policies, make sure that you consistently follow and enforce your own terms, policies, community standards, including your privacy policy, any age restrictions you have in place, and any rules on content or behavior. It's better to err on the side of caution where children's data is a factor, and to take swift action to safeguard the interests of child users. For example, social media platforms might want to have a process in place to protect children from online bullying. To ensure transparency and proper engagement with users, make sure that reporting concerns is as easy as possible and follow up on those concerns quickly. Try not to share further personal data in the process. In terms of default settings, I'm sure you can guess what we'll say here. Set privacy settings to be as private as possible by default, unless you can demonstrate a really compelling reason for using a different default setting, which takes into account the best interests of the child. Make sure that users can change the default settings based on the useful information about what each change would mean. They need to really understand what changing a setting would do. Don't let young children have control over risks that they might not understand, like sharing their personal information in a public forum. Also be careful about allowing data sharing, even with parental consent, bearing in mind that parents might not monitor their children closely once they're signed up for a service. In terms of data minimization, Make sure that you collect only the personal information required to run and improve your service, and beware of complex procedures designed to aid compliance with other aspects of the code, like age verification tools. Make sure that you're not collecting more data than you need or in a way that's disproportionate to the benefits of verification. For example, depending on what your service is, you might take the view that really robust age verification is necessary. For others, you might decide that a sort of self-age range categorization would be sufficient. In terms of data sharing, again, don't share data by default. Let children or parents, where appropriate, choose if, when, and how their information might be shared. Only share it if you have a compelling reason to do so, again, taking into account the best interests of the child. And again, think about the points that we reviewed earlier in relation to the ICO's draft code of practice on data sharing in respect to children's personal data. Halfway through, through the 16 points, on to geolocation. Again, turn location tracking off by default. Think about why and if you need it. Do you need to know roughly where your users are, or is it required for the service to work? Could you get the same result um, in a different way? Could you think about operating at a higher level, for example, thinking about a user's country or a city instead of their exact location? Make sure it's really obvious if you have location tracking turned on, thinking about an icon changing color, for example. There should also be the option to make um, a child's location visible to others, and this should default back to off at the end of each session. This is where their parent might be able to see it. And then in terms of parental controls, make sure you provide uh, easy-to-use parental controls and make them easy to access and clearly visible. Think about what key areas parents should have control over, for example, location tracking, any other monitoring, information sharing, and maybe an age-appropriate content range. 
If you do allow an online service uh, to pr sort of let the parent or carer monitor their child's online activity or track their location, provide a really obvious sign to the child so that they know they're being monitored as well. In terms of profiling, switch options which use profiling by default off unless it's absolutely necessary for the service. Only allow profiling if you've got appropriate measures in place to protect the child from any harmful effects, in particular, for example, being fed content that might be detrimental to their health or well-being. It is going to be very difficult to justify any profiling of children for sort of monetization or other commercial purposes. Next, if we look at nudge techniques, avoid encouraging children to provide any unnecessary personal data to weaken or turn off their privacy protections or extend their use. For example, cookie banners shouldn't be designed to make it significantly easier to opt into marketing cookies and leave them off. Um, think about prompting children to seek parental consent when entering personal data or suggesting screen breaks after long periods of use. Again, this is one area of the code where arguably it goes beyond the scope of managing personal data a little bit, but it is at the moment in the draft code. In terms of connected toys and devices, um, it's important to remember this doesn't just cover things that have a screen, it will also cover things that don't. So effective tools have to be made available through the device itself to enable compliance with the code in addition to anything that might come with it in terms of packaging. So in practice, that means your devices need to be programmed to recognize queries that are or could be about personal data without the user having to first visit the website, although it can redirect them to a website. In terms of online tools, make sure that you have prominent and accessible tools to help children exercise their data protection rights and report concerns. This should be monitored and any reports should be actioned swiftly. Data protection impact assessments should probably be undertaken specifically to assess and mitigate risks to children who are likely to access your service, taking into account differing ages, capacities and development needs. It may also be prudent to consider whether you should do a DPIA even if you don't think that children are likely to access your service. And again, this may go to evidencing to a regulator, for example, that you have carefully considered whether or not children might access your service and decided that they will not. If you have any sort of change in functionality or your user base, consider refreshing your DPIA. Lastly, in terms of governance and accountability, make sure you've got policies and procedures in place that demonstrate how you comply with data protection obligations, including training for your staff, particularly if they're involved in the design and development of online services which might be accessed by children. Make sure that your notices, policies, procedures, terms of service, etc. all demonstrate compliance with the provisions of the draft code. Really think about how you design them. And finally, be prepared to demonstrate your compliance with the code through record keeping. So obviously keeping children's data safe isn't solely the purview of information society services. Parents also play a really crucial role, and I'm going to hand you over to Sally to we'll speak more about this. Thanks, Tamara. So Debbie and Tamara have been looking at direct legal compliance questions for processing of children's data. And that's in the context of both the GDPR and also the developing UK data protection law. Data protection law stops short of directly interfering with the processing of personal data in the context of purely personal or household activities. Um, yet for completeness here, it's also worth briefly reflecting on the extent of the role of online tools and the role they can play in the context of parenting and whether this may, in certain cases, push at the boundaries of what falls in the scope of data protection or, or indeed wider, wider safeguards. Uh, we're seeing how Data protection law is, is, is tightening the regulation of online service providers in relation to the processing of data of children, yet this is only part of the, the broader picture when it comes to safeguarding children. Parents are the ones at the end of the day on the front line, and, and whilst technology can be part of the challenge they face uh, in safeguarding their children, technology tools are equally seen as you know, an important part of the overall approach to responsible parenting by, by supporting parents in managing their child's safety. Now, this process you know, can begin um, as early as birth, where tools like baby monitors are used uh, by parents to help provide comfort, and discreet observation, and, and monitoring. And technology developments have also led to the use of uh, technologies like cop cameras and sensors that can monitor monitor a baby's temperature and, and their breathing. Technology tools are also important for the young child when they're starting to engage with the world online for the first time. 
um, such as online apps or games, and, and clearly parents are going to wish to seek to control what their child can access, to have visibility as to what their child is doing online, and to control who they interact with. Software tools can help parents here by the application of parental filters, creating curated walled gardens of content, and through family managed accounts, providing transparency for the parent and the child. Tools also help parents to continue to know where their child is when they're, they're out of the house. So apps on a child's phone could continually share the child's location back to parents. Tools could also be used to geofence a committed zone of movement for their child outside of the home or school and where any travel by the child beyond that predetermined ring fence meant that the parents automatically notified. Location tracking is also available by way of bracelets that can be worn by a child or through radio frequency identification tags that are embedded into their clothing. Yet, as a child becomes a teenager, they may start to assert their independence and become more secretive about what they're doing. A parent who was so minded could also turn to tools that offer other stealth tracking software. Such tools embedded in their child's devices may it may even covertly track their child's location, their social media, or their other online activity. And they may even capture things like key logging strokes or audio recordings in order to read what's being typed or hear what's being said. Now, just because you know, there is this range of potential options here doesn't mean that they're used are appropriate. Clearly, there's a balance to be drawn between technology as a tool of responsible parenting to keep children safe and, and, uh, the, and um, using technology as a, as a you know, form of disproportionate intrusive parental control. In the latter case, um, intrusive technology arguably becomes part of that wider problem of protecting children's data and privacy, and this will particularly be the case where surveillance takes no account of the ability of the child to make responsible choices for themselves. So the as I mentioned, the Data Protection Act 19, uh, 2018 stops short of applying to the processing of personal data in the course of purely personal household activities, yet it is relevant where the processing of personal data in a domestic context involves processing the personal data of others. And this might be the case where uh, you've got perhaps a covert nanny cam that's being used, or there's the inappropriate sighting of a CCTV camera or the use of data captured from a child's device to infer information about others, such as perhaps fellow pupils or teachers. It's worth uh, also uh, considering here the, you know, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children, in particular Article 16, so Denny referred to this earlier, where um, it states that no child shall be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy, family or correspondence. Uh, nor to unlawful attacks on his or her honour and reputation, and the child has the right to protection of the law against such interference or attacks. The Convention right is clearly relevant to safeguarding children online, yet may be equally important in preventing unwarranted intrusion in private life from within the family. Of course, some people may argue that any excessive use of surveillance technology by parents is only a response to the limited nature of current legal and regulatory online controls or safeguards for children, which you know, currently regulated changes and initiatives are seeking to address. Notwithstanding this, there remains the risk that the exercise in an excessive way of surveillance technologies within a family could over time encourage children to accept such surveillance as normal and thereby create a cycle of behaviour or expectations that a child might take into adulthood with them and that may ultimately undermine the effectiveness of the very protections that the law and the regulation is seeking to introduce. So um, just throwing that out there as a bit of uh, a bit of an aside to the broader legal context that we've been talking about today. But um, with that, I will pass over to uh, my colleague Nikita Saini, who's going to look at some of those key other areas of regulation that can be relevant here. Thanks, Sally. Hi all, my name is Nikita Staney. I'm an associate in the data privacy team at Taylor Westing. I'll be speaking today about other areas of regulation for organisations to consider. While data protection helps to protect children's data, there are other rules which exist and they need to be considered as well in relation to special rules on the protection of children's data online. I'll begin with a brief summary on relevant context. So at present, governments around the world 
are struggling to deal with how to protect individuals online. The latest Westminster Policy Forum on advertising regulation addressed this as well. The key priority is to protect vulnerable individuals online, particularly children. The internet has been described by many as the Wild West, as we have a patchwork of regulation in place which can be difficult to map out, it can be difficult to enforce rules and regulations, and it can be difficult for online victims to seek redress. We've seen that it's still a challenge to protect individuals effectively without impinging freedom of speech and without making platforms completely responsible for third-party content. It's also a challenge to provide meaningful terms and conditions and policies which apply to children that they can really engage with meaningfully. These need to be written in a way that they can understand and will need to cater to children across a range of different age groups. And children's abilities vary vastly as children develop at different ages, as Debbie mentioned. So there's a lot of activity in this space at the moment, which is likely to result in further guidance and regulation going forward. And today we'll be discussing current areas of regulation and merging areas as well. I'll start with addressing the AVMS Directive. So the AVMS Directive is the Audiovisual Media Services Directive. This establishes the regulatory framework for broadcasters and providers of audiovisual content in the EU and extends the 2010 directive to include video sharing platforms as well. Member States have until September 2020 to implement the updated provisions in order to safeguard children from harmful content. I'll briefly summarise key points from the AVMS, which is strong on child protection. The Member States have to ensure that media service providers provide sufficient information to viewers about content which may impair the physical, mental or moral development of children. This may include measures like content descriptors, acoustic warnings and visual symbols which describe the nature of the content. Member States need to take appropriate measures to ensure that content from media service providers is made available in such a way to ensure that children will not normally hear or see them, again, where the content may impair their physical, mental or moral development. This may include measures like selecting the time of the broadcast and using age verification tools or other technical measures. The measures which are used, well, sorry, the, me the measures which are used will need to be proportionate to the potential harm of the programme. The most harmful content, such as gratuitous violence and pornography, will need to be subject to the strictest measures. These include measures like encryption and effective parental control. Children must also be protected from harmful content and hate speech on video sharing platform services. So generally, the more extreme the content is, the more extreme the protections will need to be as well. So what can organisations do? Organisations should consider the content and subject matter of an audiovisual communication really carefully. Alcohol should not be aimed specifically at children, and member states must encourage codes of conduct to reduce children being exposed to this. So we may see further alcohol-specific rules merging in the foreseeable future, which is something to look out for. Organisations should also consider the nature of the communication carefully as well. They must also not encourage children to buy or hire a product by exploiting their inexperience or the trust that children place in parents, teachers, carers, or others. They must not encourage children to persuade their parents or others to purchase the goods or services being advertised. And lastly, children must not be shown in dangerous situations. Last but not least, data privacy. Personal data of children collected or otherwise generated by media service providers cannot be used for direct marketing, profiling, and behaviorally targeted advertising. This means that organisations will also need to consider their purposes for processing personal data carefully, especially when it comes to children. At present, the UK government is currently consulting on how to implement the AVMS. As I mentioned, the AVMS is really strong in child protection, but it clearly recognises that it can't work effectively without parental responsibility, and it balances other child protection considerations with other considerations as well, which is something that Tamara mentioned earlier today. So we want to discuss the Advertising Standards Agency and relevant advertising and marketing rules. 
A bit of brief background around the different bodies that are coming into play here. The Advertising Standards Authority, or the ASA, is the UK's independent advertising regulator. The Committee of Advertising Practice, or CAP, is the ASA's sister organisation, and CAP is responsible for writing the advertising code. The ASA makes sure that ads across UK media adhere to these advertising codes. The CAP code sets out rules that apply to ads and other marketing communications, and the BCAP code, which is the UK code of broadcast advertising, applies to all ads on radio and television services licensed by Ofcom. And both codes set out relevant rules on child protection, which I'll summarise. So, both the BCAP code and the CAP code state that marketing communications or ads must not exploit children. They must not be exploited for their susceptibilities, aspirations, credulity, inexperience, or lack of knowledge. Both codes state that marketing communications or ads must not appeal to children by being reflected or being associated with youth culture. In terms of data handling, marketers particularly need to take into account children's limitations. This is particularly relevant for making sure children understand the purposes behind the processing and potential consequences of providing their personal data. As I mentioned earlier, it can be quite difficult to provide terms and policies which children can engage with in a meaningful way. Media service providers need to exercise particular caution here. Lastly, a DPIA, or Data Protection Impact Assessment, must be completed before sending direct marketing messages to individual children or using personal data to display targeted ads in an online context. I have, however, mentioned that the AVMS prohibits marketing to children in this way at all from 2020 onwards, so the rules on this point may change going forward, and again, that's something to look out for in the future. It's also really important to consider ASA guidance as well, as the relevant CAP and BCAP rules will come into play here. These are not rules per se, and they're non-binding, but they are based on previous ASA rulings and will be taken into account by the regulator when they handle complaints that they receive. The recent guidance now states that ads should not portray or represent anyone who is or seems to be under the age of 18 in a sexual way. This is from guidance from January 2018. An ad should not explicitly convey that a particular children's product, pursuit, activity, choice of play or career is inappropriate for any gender. This is from June 2019 guidance, more recent guidance, which specifically targets harmful gender stereotypes, which can be really important in shaping the way children see themselves and how they relate to the outside world. I'll now move on to look at gambling-specific rules from the ASA. In general, both codes address gambling and say that children must be protected from gambling ads. How, how has the code achieved this? The CAP code rules say that marketing communications must be socially responsible. They must ensure that children and young persons are protected from harm or exploitation from ads that feature or promote gambling. The BCAP code also states that ads must not portray, condone or encourage gambling behaviour that is socially irresponsible or could lead to financial or emotional harm. Going forward though, CAP now also released new gambling specific standards which further protects children and young people from irresponsible gambling ads. This came into effect on April 2019, and it applied to marketing communications in all media, including online channels like social media. For the purpose of these rules, a child is an individual under the age of 16, and a young person is an individual that's 16 or 17. And the guidance itself goes into great detail and provides some tangible guidance, which I'll summarise. This is useful by way of providing practical guidance about what's considered socially responsible and therefore what's considered socially irresponsible. The content will be considered irresponsible, irresponsible sorry, if it features under 18s playing a specific role or if it's directed at under 18s by being placed in media for that group or sub-age category. Content must not appear in media for children or young persons where they make up more than 25% of the audience. Similarly, content must not encourage under 18s to engage directly in potentially harmful behaviour. This includes avoiding colourful, exaggerated, animated characters like children's cartoons, animals, pirates, fairy tale characters, avoiding childlike imagery or narratives such as nursery rhymes or children's stories, and avoiding tropes of specific characters familiar to children. The guidance also recommends considering humour carefully in content. 
and considering whether it relates, resonates with the under 18. This specifically looks at slapstick or juvenile humour, so it's important to consider the nature of the humour that you're using and whether it's specifically appealing to a youthful audience. The guidance also provides youthful considerations around using celebrity figures. The marketers and advertisers should be cautious about using sports people or celebrities in marketing communication as or through endorsement agreements. So the guidance recommends considering whether they have a significant profile among under 18, particularly where they are sports or reality TV stars. From the guidance, it seems that these figures might be seen as inappropriate for use in gambling ads. Additionally, the guidance also introduces a specific age restriction. Nobody who is or who seems to be under the age of 25, this could be just based on their appearance, for example, should appear in any gambling content that's targeted at children. Now that we've looked at relevant rules and regulations in place at present, I'll move on to look at emerging rules and what we might expect going forward, looking ahead. So the first is age verification rules for adult content. The UK intends to bring in age verification for online adult content. Commercial providers of online content and pornography will be required to carry out age verification checks on users to ensure they are 18 years or older. This applies when more than a third of the content itself on the site is pornographic. Websites that fail to implement age verification technology face sanctions, including having payment services withdrawn or blocked. This new approach is the first of its kind in the world and leading the way in internet safety for children, which is a good thing. However, this has been delayed and will need to be notified by the EU regulator, which takes at least six months. So there may be some time to wait before the rules actually come into place. The rules have, however, been widely criticised and unworkable and easy to circumvent, as Debbie and Tamara mentioned. It may be possible for a user to insert an age that isn't actually their age and have access to the site. And it may change as technology changes. The rules also only apply when more than a third of the content is pornographic, so this doesn't apply to all sites. The risk of harm, I think, especially if you're a parent or a carer, is where sites contain less than a third of material but still contain material nonetheless which children might accidentally stumble across when they're using a seamlessly harmless, harmless site. It's something that it can with mine as well, as I have two of my own. The second emerging area is social media. The UK Science and Technology Committee published a recent report on the 31st January 2019. They concluded that social media companies must be subject to a legal duty of care to help young people's health and well-being when accessing their sites. The committee reports that there is currently a standard lottery among social media companies whose practices differ widely across the industry. So the committee recommends establishing a regulator which is responsible for providing guidance on how to spot and minimise the harm social media presents, taking enforcement action when warranted, and establishing a strong sanctions regime in order to be effective. Finally, the UK government has issued recommendations in its online harms white paper, which was published on April 2019. This suggests both legislative and non-legislative measures to make businesses more responsible for user safety online, especially for child protection. The key recommendation made in this white paper includes appointing a regulatory body. This regulator would ideally implement, oversee and enforce a new regulatory framework. The regulator would establish appropriate enforcement powers it would implement potential redress mechanisms for online users, and it would have measures to ensure that regulation is targeted and proportionate for the industry. The proposed regulatory framework would be intended to apply to companies which allow users to share or discover user-generated content or interact with each other online. This includes social media companies, public discussion forums, retail sites which allow online product reviews, file sharing sites, instant messaging sites, search engines, and cloud hosting providers. So while we've discussed practical tips about what organisations can do online in terms of implementing existing measures, there are measures that will be coming into place which we foresee will be coming into place, looking at emerging rules and regulations and that's something to be mindful of going forward in the future. Because practical measures that you're looking at implementing now might not be the best practical measures that you'll use to implement going forward as the, the landscape is critically changing and it's moving in a new direction which the world has simply hasn't seen before. So just by way of closing remarks, it's clear that there's a patchwork of existing rules, 
regulation and guidance. And this is only going to develop further based on emerging rules that we've discussed as well. So going forward, organisations need to do three key things. One, consider the existing path to work of legislation rules and consider the guidance as well as a key priority. Two, be mindful of emerging rules which are coming up based on what we discussed going forward. And finally, remain committed to the interest and protection of children, which is the core priority. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand over back to Sally for the next section. Thanks, Nikita. So we've now reached that point in the webinar where we run through a few polling questions to gauge your views on some of the topics we've covered in the webinar today. So without further ado, I will pull up the question. So the first question, is your use of children's personal data A, regular, B, occasional, or C, incidental? So if you can complete your response to that and submit. And then the next question set, what steps are you likely to take to prepare for the age-appropriate design code? Is it none immediately, but we'll wait and see how it's enforced? Some steps to demonstrate that the code won't apply to us. Moderate steps in terms of updating elements of our service, e.g. transparency and just-in-time notices. Or in-depth in terms of planning significant changes across all many of the 16 areas of the draft code that Tamara walked us through earlier. Then the third of the questions is, how likely do you foresee future legal challenges to the reliance on personal or household activity exemptions in connection with parental surveillance tools? So if you think that you foresee future legal challenges to be unlikely, that's A. Otherwise, you think they might be possible, that's B. Or highly likely is C. So while you're considering your uh, answers to those polling questions and we wait for your responses to come through, which will just take a couple of minutes, uh, sorry, a couple of seconds, I'll just explain for those of you who are unfamiliar with Taylor West that who we are. Uh, we're a leading international law firm acting for a range of clients in local and international markets and you can see a slide about us as, as a firm at a glance there. Um, we are, provide a full service law firm offering from our office footprint, which you can see spans Northern, Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East, Asia, as well as our US representative offices. Our data protection practice is equally international in scope. We are a global 22 partner driven international team and we're complemented by a broader international network of data privacy law specialists advising on all areas of data protection. As you may already be aware, we have a dedicated microsite for all things data protection, which is our global data hub, and you can learn more about our practice, access our updates, news, resources, including weekly and bi-monthly mail shots if you register, topical issues where we look at regular issues that are raising concerns, issues of challenges, and also to see details of our forthcoming webinars and also recordings of our archived webinars. The global data hub is also where you can, um, you can access uh, some of our tools, such as our Global Data Protection Guide, and you can compare where you can compare national laws, and you can also find out more about our TW Cyber Response app, which helps companies to develop, prepare for, react, and respond quickly and effectively should a breach occur. And some more detail on those there. So, let's just go back to the polling question. So, the first question was. Is your use of children's data, uh, personal data, regular, occasional, or incidental? And the majority, um, by a slight, sm only a small amount, say that it's, it's at the moment it's incidental. Um, but uh, about a third um, are uh, making regular use of children's data. Um, what steps are you likely to take to prepare for the age-appropriate design code? So, it's pretty even split here. So. 30% are preparing to take an in-depth um, approach to their, their um, 
procedures to comply with the age appropriate design code, about 40, just under 40% are, are going to be taking a moderate approach and 30% will be taking some, but only 6% are planning at this stage to do nothing. So, so I think everyone who's listening today feels pretty engaged with this subject and knows that they're going to be doing at least something to anticipate and plan for the code. Um, and then finally, how likely do you foresee future legal challenges to the reliance on the personal or household activity exemption in connection with parental surveillance tools? And interestingly, uh, the majority of people think that the, the risk is increased as technology perhaps provides parents with more possibilities to, to, uh, to uh, uh, apply technology to the relationship they have with their children. Um, 62% of you thought that it was quite possible, 31% uh, thought it highly likely. So only a, a small percentage, percentage of listeners thought that it was unlikely that uh, there would be future legal challenges in relation to uh, that reliance on that exemption. So with that, I think we have come to the end of our time uh, today. I know we have had some questions, um, uh, for example, on the uh, audio visual media directive, which I I know that uh, Nikita has already spoken to in her session. Uh, to the extent that we've had other questions, we will review those uh, after the webinar and follow up with people directly uh, where we can. Um, so with that, I just wanted to let you know that, as mentioned before, there are recordings of the, our webinars on our Global Data Hub, and the recording of this webinar and the slides will be made available shortly on our Global Data Hub microsite. Uh, uh, from which you can also access details of our, our future events and webinars. Um, and so with that, it's, it's just left to me to thank you for joining us today, and uh, we hope that you'll join us again. Thank you.